Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, and again, my name is Carl Zimmerman. I'm a GIS coordinator from the state GIS office. And today I'm going to be talking about the Energy and LIDAR program that is ongoing, uh, which you'll learn more about, um, and some of the QAQC problems and activities we're doing, along with uh, the calendar that uh, you can expect to see deliverables. Um, first, it's a quick sidebar. We have started looking at the imagery and we've done uh, uh, initial imagery quality control for the Northwest Hills. We'll call that the block one. Um, and overall, the imagery has been delivered, has been, has been excellent. There are a few minor issues with things like dark shadows on ridges, uh, some bright streaking on hot spots in lakes and waters, a few small snow patches, which we'll see um, in a moment, um, and then a few areas with some longer shadows. All of these are within the specifications, uh, but you'll see that overall the quality is very good and uh, useful for a lot of applications. So that was kind of the, uh, the quick uh, uh, initial view. Let's talk uh, some background here. I know a lot of you have seen various uh, parts of this presentation, but for those of you who don't know RAT, I'm going to do some background here. So again, the state has uh, procured uh, imagery and LIDAR for 2023 and 2026. They're, right now we're in the process of uh, reviewing and delivering the 2023 data. Um, that consists of both imagery and uh, LIDAR. The imagery is three inch, LIDAR is high resolution, very high resolution of 15 to 20 points per meter. Um, and then we have a variety of downstream products from that. From the imagery, we have what's called true ortho, where you have, uh, they eliminate any distortion and parallax. And I'll show you an example of that. Uh, from the LIDAR, we have multiple classes, including three vegetation classes, which we hope will be useful for site level, um, site level urban uh, forestry projects. We have a, of course, the DEM, uh, which will be a two foot product. We have a one foot contour product. And then we have uh, a very impressive 2D and 3D building footprint uh, data sets that will uh, cover the entire state. These are basically anything more than 100 square feet, which essentially is a shed. You know, bigger in the shed will have document uh, documentation of that building footprint. Um, we haven't worked out all of the delivery on the on the services side, but um, Emily Wilson's group at Yukon Clear will will be uh, serving up imagery including the RGB and infrared and uh, the DEM. Um, we, that is the, the GIS office will be serving up uh, the 2D buildings and contours. Um, we're still working on the 3D building side of things. At the very minimum, you'll have some kind of uh, data download or, or sharing, um, but you'll see that that's a, a fairly complicated data set that has some unique challenges. And then right now we're also looking at ver uh, options for uh, getting impervious cover. Uh, I don't want to, don't have anything uh, locked up yet, but we're trying to get uh, some impervious cover plan metrics, which uh, will be incredibly useful at the town level for things like driveways, sidewalks, and roads. Um, we've made some progress in that. We'll have an update on that in the next month or two when we get farther down the line. Okay, some quick examples of what the products look like. This is your natural color uh, free band RGB. Um, this is the classic aerial imagery, and this is now coming in. Um, it, it's three inch, so both you have uh, incredible detail and very nice uh, crispness in the uh, color and values. Uh, I know you know on the left, you can see the chairs around the picnic tables on back porches. Um, you can see things like drainage infrastructure and cracks in the sidewalk. Um, so there are many town level applications uh, where, uh, such as stormwater, where you could use this imagery to uh, uh, do in-chair uh, data review. We also have an infrared band, which is also three inch, which is pretty unusual. Um, for those of you who don't know, three inch uh, infrared is very useful for land cover classification, and it helps you identify different types of land cover. You can see the red color uh, in front of the school there, that's the you know emerging spring grass versus the uh, sort of uh, rough uh, leaf off um, 
forced area on the upper left-hand corner. And on the right, there's a, this is a very interesting feature. Normally, uh, infrared is, uh, you know, doesn't have any reflectance with water, but you'll notice that on the sort of left side of that pond on the right image, you can see a blob of um, red. That's actually emergent vegetation. So this uh, product might be very useful for looking at emergent vegetation in wetlands and, and ponds. Um, so you have some very high resolution uh, uh, near infrared imagery here that will be useful in a lot of land cover applications. Okay, so as part of the imagery deliverable, we will have True Ortho, and True Ortho is this corrected product. Basically, uh, instead of having an an angled shot from the plane, it corrects it uh, so that it it looks tr completely vertical. You can see the uh, sail building on the right um, in downtown Hartford. And notice that you can see all the way around the building for the pedestrian areas. So in high density urban areas, you get uh, a lot of more detail in the uh, areas with uh, large buildings, those like Hartford, New Haven, Stanford. And you can see there are about 60 on the left. You can see about 60 areas where we'll capture this true ortho. I should note that true ortho has been a, a real pain uh, for the uh, vendor uh, because of the re resolution of the LIDAR. And that has been a source of one of the uh, a place for a slowdown of uh, some of the deliverables. Um, we're, we're having a 15 and 20 uh, points per meter LIDAR delivered. Um, it is extremely good and you can get some remarkable detail. It, it's particularly useful in extracting buildings and other surface features like vegetation. Um, and it should be extremely good uh, as an input into our digital elevation model. As part of that classification, we are uh, doing three classes of vegetation, low, uh, medium, and high vegetation. And basically this allows us to find uh, ornamental, sorry, ornamental and forest, uh, ornamental street trees and for, uh, forest land. And we can, we're hoping that we can actually identify individual street trees uh, on a statewide basis, that's a that's a future project, but uh, that's the ultimate goal here is to uh, be able to provide a, a site level uh, tree canopy analysis for urban applications. Um, the DEM product uh, is pretty uh, sophisticated. It has um, um, hydro flattening, which means where you have a pond or or uh, lake type area. The DM is flat. It also has validated flow lines. Uh, that's the monotonicity uh, terminology. And so basically for big streams and rivers, you get uh, a validated flow line. Um, you also have uh, brake lines at bridges so that you don't, where you have a bridge and you have water flowing underneath it, you don't get that, uh, that backup if you're running a, a, an urban hydrology model. Should be a very good product. This is a very exciting for people who work in stormwater and um, land management uh, and will be very, very and directly useful into the uh, urban hydrology realm. Um, the DEM is kind of the you know, newer product, but lots of people, uh, including me, started off with a, you know, looking at uh, elevation through contours. We will have a one foot contour map. Uh, as you see, running down the middle of this, you can see a, uh, you can see a stone wall, and the the contours reflect the stone wall. So these are very detailed and will be very useful for uh, land development and civil engineering type applications. Um, the two uh, D buildings um, are going to uh, be uh, for across the state. There there are, there are going to be a lot of buildings, probably over a million. Um, and these are actually derived from LIDAR, not aerial. And, and so these will be very high quality. Um, again, the uh, complications related to both high density LIDAR and uh, LIDAR derived products has uh, caused the vendor to need to get, uh, spend some time developing more processes. You'll see a little bit later about this, but uh, this is a good time to mention the combination of three inch imagery and 15 points per meter squared um, uh, across an entire state uh, pushed uh, the processing workflows of the vendor and that has taken some time to resolve 
we think we're doing well with that now moving forward. But uh, again, uh, some new processes had to be developed. Um, we are also getting a 3D building data set. Um, and these are a level to LOD2, which means you have some roof structure and some uh, details uh, in the roof line. Uh, they're not just uh, cubes with uh, flat roofs. Um, you can see on the top one, uh, that's actually a flat roof, kind of a early 1900s uh, residential building. Um, it correctly modeled the uh, flat roof. And then you have the overhang from the porch. These uh, 3D models don't capture the, uh, the underlying part of the roof overhang on a porch. Uh, they're basically solids, but you will be able to map uh, uh, imagery to them for um, land uh, use visualization products. Uh, on the bottom uh, it is an example of uh, the, how the sh roof line shape is nicely captured. Um, on the building on the left of the Chevy truck, you have that beveled front, and you can see it's nicely uh, caught. And then you have the standard uh, roof line on the right for a, a, a typical ranch. So these uh, will take a lot of uh, work to validate. The vendor has um, pledged that um, for high value buildings, that is, you know, churches, libraries, and and big, uh, you know, iconic buildings, they will uh, make sure that they get them the way that are needed. Um, there's a little bit, you know, these are a little bit hard to QA uh, because of the complexity, uh, but uh, we're happy that uh, we'll be able to provide you with some of these iconic buildings in, in as good shape as possible. All right, so now moving on to the delivery phase. Um, we, had, we started off the, the design of the project was with four blocks the Northwest Hills, the Southwest Hills, including West Cog uh, and a Metro Cog, um, three, which is in the center of the state and four. So then initially we were going one, two, three, four. That has changed and I'll explain why in a few moments. Uh, we also have uh, parts to these blocks. Uh, block one has two parts, block two has two parts, block three has three parts and block four has five parts. Um, I do wanna note that these blocks uh, kind of roughly uh, correspond with urban and non-urban areas. And you'll see why it's important in a moment. Um, the urban areas are much more work to QA and validate than the non-urban areas. And that is uh, that is a, a critical factor in uh, the delivery schedule uh, and the de delivery schedule change, which I'll we'll mention in a minute here. Okay, so the, the block one has had the imagery delivered. Um, the initial review has been completed and that's been returned to the vendor. We should be seeing a final product shortly. The GIS, uh, LIDAR and DEM are, are more or less done. Uh, they're going through the final QA. Again, I'll explain to the QA process. The QA process is very complicated and very extensive and you'll, you'll see um, uh, why uh, in a moment. Uh, block two is the Southwest uh, part of the state. Um, we, uh, they are uh, finishing up the imagery and, uh, the, and they're validating and checking the GIS data, including LIDAR and buildings. Um, that were, there was a large delay in, the, in block two because of the extensive uh, uh, urban core between Greenwich, Stanford and uh, Norwalk um, in particular. And what the vendor found was uh, because of the high density of data, um, there was uh, some warping in the buildings. That's the slight undulation in the edge and they wanted to get a process figured out. Um, hold on, do you have a... We do, Carl. We, we didn't specify if you wanted to have questions at the end or during, um, but we do have Margot Burns with a question. Do you want to take um, an hour? Can, can, we, can, can we take that at the end? Certainly can, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Margo. Thanks. Thanks, Margo, for the wait. Um, so the uh, let's see where um, so the key thing, uh, the key issue here was that the imagery, uh, because of the high density of points, and uh, there was a, a a little bit of warping. And what the vendor discovered is that there were a point, a few points within the footprint of the building were causing uh, the the correction, which is based on lidar, uh, to cause these waves. They have, they have worked to create a workflow that they can edit with and automate 
to improve it. I think they have reached that point where they successfully figured out the process. And so again, they're moving forward. Uh, Dewberry to a fault has tried to deliver quality products. It has caused delays, but the so far the evidence is that the end product is going to be good. All right. So we have had a change in the schedule. Um, this was a source of an, an internal discussion. Um, and we decided that it made sense to get the imagery products to people as soon as possible because that is the of all the data sets, that's the highest priority. And because of this, uh, these issues related to the the urban uh, uh, versus rural uh, complexity, um, we have uh, the vendor is going to provide the imagery for the more slightly more rural areas first. Um, so, block one has been delivered. Block two, the upper half, which is uh, places like uh, Reading and um, uh, small towns up in uh, West Cog primarily uh, is uh, just about ready to be delivered. Then uh, the southern half is coming. Block four will be next, uh, the, the western half. And then uh, after block four, block three will be uh, occurring. And uh, um, I feel bad for uh, the uh, central part of the state. They were promised stuff early. Uh, hopefully you can bear with us, with us and you'll get high quality products that you can use for several years to come. Um, the LIDAR is, been, uh, is less altered. It more or less is proceeding as planned, which is block one going in, in you know, sequential order. Block one is going to be delivered this week. Um, it is in QA, QC. Block two is uh, uh, under the review process along with the northern half of block three and block four. LIDAR is definitely uh, proceeding better than, lot, uh, than the imagery uh, with less slowdowns. So this is the overall schedule. Um, you'll see that the, 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 the core of the schedule, if, you, if you've if you seen the earlier one, hasn't changed, but basically block two uh, comes in, April, uh, in March, block four comes in uh, March and April, and block five comes in May. And then uh, the uh, LIDAR dates uh, are coincide roughly with it, uh, uh, with those times. And uh, of course, we will also have a QA process with this. So these are the vendor delivery dates to us. And then you have to keep in your mind, everything is plus, uh, you know, uh, about uh, four to six weeks. First, we have to do a QAQC, and there's a lab elaborate process that you'll see. Then we need to return it, and then it, it needs to be posted either uh, through a download service or an imagery service. So um, some of you will not be seeing, you know, especially in block three and four, won't be seeing data until the summer. Uh, so just uh, keep that in mind when you see these dates. All right. So I want to be, um, you know, we want to be totally transparent about the issues here. Um, I've mentioned some of them, but first thing, uh, just kind of go down the list here. The first thing was we flipped the schedule to get imagery to the that was completed to you faster. And the urban areas will be a little delayed because of this uh, rippling uh, uh, or warping effect. Um, there was these, there are these issues with a very large amount of LIDAR and um, uh, imagery. That's going to be over 60 terabytes in the end uh, for the state. And uh, it pushed both the, the software and the hardware capacity of the vendor. Um, we also are going to have that same problem, uh, even with uh, two new servers, servers with 10 terabytes each. Um, True Ortho is more labor intensive and complicated uh, with the higher loop resolution data. And that caused an initial delay in the pilot study. So the pilot study was really where most of the initial problems were. Um, this imagery warping uh, issue. Uh, came because of these horizontal and vertical faces were uh, had more detail and there were so even small uh, additional errors uh, caused uh, some warping in the imagery. Um, we are under the we're operating under the assumption that the vendor is producing high quality products. Uh, they have changed the schedule a couple of times. Um, right now we are going to uh, roll with that and uh, hopefully they'll produce. 
Um, I will say that when products have come out, they've been high quality. And when they have worked on them, they uh, the products have improved. The 3D buildings especially have noticeably improved over each iteration. Um, uh, so barring some uh, you know, major change from here on in, we will keep with the schedule and the, the same approach. All right, so uh, now we're gonna uh, go into a slightly different uh, part of the presentation. This is about the QAQC process. Um, we're dealing with billions of LiDAR points and, and millions, if not uh, millions of pixels, um, and then even a, a million or more vector products like um, buildings. These are unimaginably huge data sets that no you know, single person can view. So uh, you have to both trust the workflow and also do uh, quality sampling of these large data sets to look for systematic errors. And so there's a whole slew of steps that I want you to be aware of if you're not uh, that may uh, happen before you uh, get to see the data. So first thing is that there was a pilot project validation piece and that came um, that came uh, uh, several months ago where we got uh, test products for, and we used East Haven as a, uh, a test point. We looked at those products and then uh, we validated the approach of the vendor, at least the output. Dewberry has a, a very extensive um, testing regime uh, that go, it goes into hundreds of uh, subroutines. Dubai has an independent subcontractor working for them that uh, has their own set of validation checks. So they basically do their do it as an internal checks. The independent the contractor then gets the, does a series of checks and then it gets released to us. And they, the, we ourselves are also doing um, a bunch of checks uh, of the data to get uh, a, a sampling of uh, the different types of uh, outputs for different land covers. So here is what the... Um, uh, the vendor uh, uh, checklist looks like it covers everything from visual uh, quality to uh, uh, horizontal accuracy. Um, and so everything goes through this check. So our job really at the end of the line here, we're, we're the fourth person uh, entity to evaluate uh, the product is to look for systematic errors, really uh, things that are uh, uh, unforgivable and just plain misses that were uh, not caught by the process. Um, the imagery work group is uh, working in conjunction with the, the our office uh, to review all the uh, deliverables. And so we'll uh, we'll later on in another meeting give a shout out to all the people participating. Um, but uh, things like contours and buildings and the DEM are all going to be uh, uh, checked at different levels. And we, everyone has an assignment to work on that. Um, I've also been working with the COGS and we met with the COGS on the west side of the state last week and I appreciate uh, your participation. We had excellent turnout and uh, we have a lot of people who are willing to help. The COGS are gonna look at the imagery and also the building footprints in 2D. Uh, in about uh, three or four weeks, we'll have a meeting uh, with the uh, COGS on the central part of the state and west side of the state to, to go through a similar thing. So this is part of this uh, filtering process where we look for systematic errors. So it's not just uh, the vendor side, but also our side and the, and the users uh, such as the COGS. The, a couple more minutes of slides and I'll take uh, questions for five uh, minutes. So there is a platform where we're looking at uh, the data and you can see these calls uh, in there. Basically, you, you look at an imagery area, uh, you validate it on a, a series of factors, um, and then uh, you uh, uh, identify the error and then the vendor responds. So this is the, we're using this whole platform here to as a feedback loop between us and the vendor. Um, standard web environment, and people who were at the training last week saw this. Uh, I, I want to be very clear that part of this process is calibrating the uh, uh, calibrating the uh, the people doing quality control, and so we have examples such as you're seeing here that uh, people can look at. We also have a, a, an internal validity um, checklist where people have a bunch of uh, things to identify, and then um, for uh, calibration, 
uh, we have examples of what, what is and is not uh, uh, appropriate. In this case, this is 2D buildings. And then finally, um, the GIS office, primarily me, but the GIS office will be providing the, the sampling uh, scheme for the tiles. So people who are participating will get uh, you know, a selection of tiles, not that many. It's only gonna be between one and 5% of the total tiles. And, uh, and those people helping will then review uh, their areas of uh, interest, typically in their region, um, for uh, problems uh, after a, a training session with us. So with that, I will open it up for questions. I don't know, Mike, if you want to um, call it out or what? Yeah, I'll pass it over to Zach. Zach will be All our right. host. And uh, I, I have questions personally, but I like to let the group go first. Uh <laughs> Probably fill up all that. Yeah, if if anyone has questions, um, you know, you can raise your hand, um, come off uh, mute, you know. I'm not and, uh, seeing while, while, while people are uh, thinking about questions, uh, I see a couple of references to the boxes of disks. Um, we can work with you uh, to get the data delivered. Uh, we uh, as the data starts coming out, uh, if you're interested in getting a, a data uh, before the services are set up, we can help you with that. Uh, you'll just have to contact us. And Carl, just to clarify, I had a, I guess, a quick question uh, from me here. Um, I know that they were coming out, or you, you were receiving the data in phases. Um, is that data going to become available in phases, or is that waiting until? You have everything to push it out. Yeah, we have that, that that's been a, the, the, I mean, most of the reason we we readjust the schedule is so that we can do phased uh, release. So the Northwest Hills was you know the first thing that got QA'd. Um, that's already back to the vendor. As soon as we get uh, that back and it's it's tiled, uh, uh, Emily can uh, Wilson at UConn Clear can uh, uh, get that up. And so we'll do we will do a phased release of those uh, that information, um, that imagery, and we will uh, we have we have some blog posts and as the uh, we'll use blog posts to let people know when things become available as well. So there'll be a ongoing uh, source of information as the uh, the data is reviewed, checked, and then uh, released. Hey Carl, I'm seeing some questions in the chat. Uh, one person, Patrick, is wondering if you're still looking for. QC volunteers. Uh, yeah, uh, Patrick, uh, we will uh, need help, uh, especially in uh, blocks three and four. Block three is is massive, uh, and um, what? Uh, so yes, we, we will. Is uh, send me an email or uh, drop your name in the chat, and we can pick that up. Um, it's uh, we will have an additional round of training in, a, in about three or four weeks, and for those people who are interested, can participate in that one. Excellent. Thanks. And uh, for folks out there, if you do want to prefer writing a question in the chat, you can do that and we'll try to find them. Uh, I have a question for you, Carl. I can't raise Here my Mike. hand, so I have to just jump in, Zach. Sorry. Uh, so this this is kind of the first time the GIS office is kind of collecting all this data and setting it all up. I know there were some delays. Do we suspect that we'll see some modest or substantial improvement in the future for the process of getting the data together or... Yeah, we're, well, we're really lessons learned, I guess, is my question. Uh, so one of the things that, uh, you know, we, uh, uh, what for all these delays, what we, uh, you know, what we've been trying to encourage the vendor to do is get an automated review. They Part of this process has been to get them to understand their, the, the workflow uh, and personnel capacity needed to uh, do these products. Um, several things like the true ortho, the high density LIDAR, and the 3D uh, buildings are somewhat uncommon uh, in, uh, in uh, at the state level. Um, so it required, uh, you know, some additional uh, work on their side. In 2026, there really won't be much room for error. So it, it's absolutely, you know, imperative that uh, these processes work. Um, and we're hoping and expecting that uh, this is the time that the, uh, the workflows will be smoothed out and uh, auto fully automated. Very good, thanks. All right, thank you, Carl. 
I think with that, um, you know, if you have any more questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, but we are at 930. So I think we're going to move on to our next presenter. We have Jen Powelzik, uh, the GIS database manager um, out of UConn, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. I know you're a specific office there, Jen. Um, but Jen will be presenting on crash data. So take it away. OK, thanks so much. Uh, yes, let me share my screen here. OK. Seems to be loading. There it is. is it OK, all right. OK, good. <laughs> Um, okay, so thanks, Zach. Uh, like you just said, my name is Jim Walczyk. I'm from the Connecticut Transportation Safety Research Center at UConn. Um, and today I just wanted to give a little update on our crash data that we have available for you all. Uh, if this in any way, shape, or form sounds familiar to you, maybe you've been a user of the crash data repository, or maybe you've heard um, my colleague Aaron Nash or I talking about the uh, crash dashboards and the different emphasis areas we have available there. Um, but we just wanted to highlight a couple of new features that we have available in the dashboards, as well as um, the REST services for you all to be able to use in the projects that you have. Um, so this is our portal homepage and everything I'm gonna go over today is listed in here. I can drop this link in the chat after, after I kind of go over everything um, and Quickly, I just wanted to touch on what we have. So we have our, our features, featured apps, and then the REST services that kind of feed all these apps so that, like I said, if you needed to be able to use this data for a specialized specific query, you absolutely can. Um, we are, of course, always here as a reference and a resource. So if you have questions, you can feel free to, to reach out to us to ask. But um, sometimes users have very specific questions they're looking to answer, or uh, maybe you're just curious about uh, specific crash types in your area. Uh, so the first area I wanted to touch on was the uh, crash dashboards. So you, you might, if you've heard us talk about this, this is likely what you've heard us uh, go over and seen us go over. Uh, we recently did the 11.2 Enterprise update, and so there's a couple of new features in here available for uh, you all to use. And uh, most specifically, the most exciting ones for us were uh, having a mobile view of this enabled. So if you're looking at it on a smaller screen, this would obviously be really difficult on like a cell phone or even a tablet. Um, so now there's the mobile view that's enabled. Uh, we have the whole dashboard refresh, so if you set a bunch of filters or you're zooming around on the map a lot and you want to be able to refresh it, you can now hit the reset button. And we have the data download available, which was not previously available uh, for us as um, enterprise users. So, you know, these tools are really great because you can access the data and people would filter down to their specific area and they would want to be able to filter out the crashes that they had queried, um, but without the data download previously, uh, that wasn't available. So this is a great new feature that's in here. Um, the crash dashboards overall, if you haven't seen these before, these are different emphasis areas of Connecticut crashes. And essentially all that means is they're showing um, different types of crashes. So. The one I specifically have loaded is for non-motorists, so pedestrians or bicyclists that are involved in crashes uh, throughout the state. The um, dates of these dashboards, the time frame is 2015 to present, uh, taking into account that there's about a 30 to 60 day lag. And when the data kind of comes in through the system, it, it goes through a little bit of a uh, quality control check. Uh, it's processed, uh, usually most severe injury uh, first, and then property damage only second. So those are sometimes what you'll see kind of lag in later. And then fatals um, are kind of in a league of their own with that because that's a more intense investigation. So those could be up to two years before you see them fully in the data. Uh, but what's nice about this is it's updated nightly. So it's the most um, 
refresh data that you could possibly have available in here. Uh, the next part I wanted to touch on quickly is um, that we have a complement to our crash dashboards now available in the form of person level dashboards. So it's all the same emphasis areas of crashes, but now you can see them at a bit more of a granular level and you can see the person level information. Essentially, the difference, main difference here is in the crash level, you're just going to see uh, one point per crash. So say there's two pedestrians that are involved in a crash, which qualifies it as a non-motorist crash. You're just gonna see that data show up in here one time and you're gonna see the crash specific metrics um, about the crash in, in the dashboard and in the data. Uh, with the person level, you're going to see now in theory, the both of those pedestrians um, in that crash and their individualized information. So if you're looking for ages or um, each individual person's injury level or whatever that might be, it's housed in here. Um, again, we have the, the refresh, the mobile view, the download available here as well. And depending on the emphasis area you're looking at, uh, that will change slightly. So uh, the majority of them are drivers um, as that's what kind of encapsulates the emphasis area. But for ones such as like motor coach, transit bus, school bus, we have both the drivers and passengers available. And then uh, depending on the emphasis area, it's something that you can filter down if you wanted to. So if you wanted to see based off the person type, uh, the passenger or driver, you could go ahead and do that in here. Um, I believe Aaron put this out on the listserv towards the end of last year when it went public and live. Uh, and we got some good feedback from you all. But if you haven't seen this yet, it's a neat tool and resource to be able to use. Um, so if you're looking at this and you say, well, this is really great. This can answer some of my questions. But maybe you have a more in-depth study area that you want to be able to look through. Uh, part of our goal with all of this was to make the data more accessible. Um, so by having the download, that's really nice. And, and for some users, this, is, this can answer all their questions. But if you have a more in-depth query that you're looking to run, or maybe you want to do some spatial filtering or whatever it might be, we have um, all of our REST services available here. So uh, you can get to this through our, the homepage of our portal again. And if you were to, I just preloaded all this to kind of make it a little bit faster. But if you were to open this up, you would see all the different emphasis areas that we have available uh, shared with you here. So uh, essentially, depending on the different type of crash you're looking to see, um, you can open these up and pull the data from here. Now, uh, this isn't meant to replace our crash data repository by any means. And so if you had uh, very specific questions or you wanted to look at all types of crashes, that would still be the, the place and the resource to view that. But again, if you were looking to see uh, non-motorist crashes, if we were to just open up what's available here, uh, you can see some basic level information uh, and the description of the emphasis area. For some of these, it's a little bit shorter. Non-motorist is a little bit more straightforward. It's uh, bicyclists and pedestrians. But if it's something like uh, fixed object crashes or aggressive crashes, it specifically lists out the metrics that qualify the crash to be in that emphasis area. So this could be a little bit more in depth just depending on uh, what you're looking at. So here you'll also find the different layers we have available. So like I said, we Previously, all we had was the crash level. So we've recently added to this. So now you have the person level in the dashboards like I just showed, and you have the vehicle level, um, which is a th the third leg of the dashboards that we're kind of in final QA, QC with um, available here so that we have, the, we have the layer available and hopefully the dashboards will be available uh, shortly uh, or just kind of finalizing the QA, QC of them before we push them out live. So if you wanted to be able to use these in your own maps, you could, or if you wanted to open it in, a, in the map viewer, you could as well. Um, if, if you're not familiar for any reason, you can always pull the URL from down here, bring you to the REST endpoint, and then you can add this into um, your project in Pro to be able to filter down to the, the area you wish to see. Um, just to kind of, 
go over one more time the difference. Um, so the first layer is going to be the crash level. So you'll just see one point per crash and you'll see the overall crash um, information. The person level will be whatever the, the person is in the emphasis area. So if it's a non-motorist, it'll be the pedestrian or bicyclist, but a lot of times it could be the driver. So if you're looking at teen drivers, it'll be the teen driver. Um, and then the for the vehicle level information, uh, you'll get information on the vehicle or possibly vehicles involved in the crash, depending on if they fall within the emphasis area. So if it's for a teen driver, it'd be whatever they're driving. Um, but if it's for non-motorists, it would be the striking vehicle. So kind of just gives that little bit more uh, information that to make it more accessible for you all. Uh, and what's nice about this as well is we have it all related. So if you were to kind of peruse through um, in a web map or create your own apps, you can, you can kind of see that information as well. Um, Again, this is, this is just if you were to add the layer to a map, what you would see when you load it up. You have uh, all three layers available in here, uh, really just to make it a little bit more available um, on the front end, and that's, that's kind of our goal with all this. Uh, again, if, if you had more specific in-depth questions, we're always happy to, um, to help answer those or, or go over what specific things mean. Uh, sometimes this data can be a little bit confusing to go through. So, uh, you know, we're definitely still a resource here. Um, I know we had just a quick window. Did anybody have any any questions on the, the data available? Uh, hey, Jen, this is Meg McGaffin. Um, I just wanna uh, say that my the staff in my office, they rely on the crash data um, all the time for a ton of their work. And these new changes are are just really amazing and helpful, and uh, we really appreciate the work that that you guys are doing. Thank you. Awesome, thanks. Glad to hear it. Um, yeah, this this is all new. So pretty much since the end of last year, we did our upgrade, and then we pushed out all the new feature services, um, which I think we finished probably mid January. So this is brand new stuff available, which is really great. Jen, we got a question in the chat from Jay Jackson. Did you do okay. the whole dashboard in ArcGIS or just the map? Also, looks great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so the the dashboards are uh, so we have an enterprise portal set up, and the the dashboards are created through um, through our enterprise portal. And then the platform we have for this to house all these different tabs is actually an experience builder. So it's uh, they're all individually embedded in here to kind of make it easier to navigate through. Having them individual like that, does that help with processing time? Oh, that's a great question. So um, <laughs> this is a lot of a lot of data, and especially because it's on a nightly update, and uh, we have. Uh, people hitting it. So uh, we kind of scaled our environment and made some changes there as well to make it easier and faster for rendering and loading. Uh, smaller emphasis areas like the non-motorist one, you know, typically might not be too much of an issue, but if you're looking at the aggressive crashes where you, you have um, over 100,000 points, it could load pretty slow. Uh, Aaron is definitely the expert on our environment, but essentially we we scaled it so we have three different um, servers on the back end to kind of offload and balance to help with that. Um, we also, when we updated the services, we made everything dedicated, which helped with the load and rendering times uh, quite a bit. Uh, in addition to the back end processing of it, which is all run in SQL Server. Um, if any of you are familiar with the back end of the crash data, it looks like it's a series of tables that come in. Um, and so we kind of fuse them all together and we have a nightly procedure that kind of truncates and refreshes all the data as it comes through um, to kind of help with that loading time. Hey, Jen, I have a, a quick question. Um, so you mentioned that you don't have all the crashes as a service, correct? It's just kind of broken up into these subcategories? Right now, yes, it's just broken up into the subcategories. That's kind of our uh, big project for this year is having an all crashes view. Um, so it's something that we're kind of working on testing out. Uh, 
So ho hopefully that is something we have available soon. Um, the all crashes view of it that we have that we're kind of working on as a trial is the same fields that we have available in like these individualized views. Um, you know, so for the full span of fields that's available in the crash area, you'd still have to go to the repository for, but if there are, if you just wanted to see all crashes in your, your area, so your town or cog or whatever it might be, that's what um, the all crashes view might be most useful okay. for. Yeah, that'd be great. I know sometimes we just get a little request, like give me the total number of crashes, like on this one route and it's, you know, download it from the repository and then do everything. So that'd be very helpful. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, I'm glad there's a need for it. Yeah. Like I said, we're just kind of testing out um, what that's kind of going to look like and what uh, additional resources we might need in place for it since it would be a much larger data set. So. Great. I have a question for you, Jen. Sure. Um, so, oh, also announcement to the group, we are extending this out another five minutes to 950, the questions. And uh, you can raise your hand or type them in, and we'll get them. Uh, Jen, I have a, so these visualization tools are awesome. And but I was I was and I was wondering, is there a does the department you're in do you also provide like a report where you provide your insights as well, like your discoveries and observations and takeaways, or are you strictly like, hey, this is the data you check it out, you take your takeaways. What's the role you play there? So, so we have a we have a lot of different tools available at the center. This is definitely just one of them. Um, if if we were to look at the crash data repository, we also have a series of of other tools available. So we have our advanced viewer. If you wanted to be able to download and pull data from there, we also have some Tableau dashboards. So if you were looking in your specific area and you wanted to see. Um, I think that's actually this is this one here. Uh, specific uh, emphasis area information over the last three years, um, and a little bit more in depth, like query reports and descriptions that's available here. Um, it totally depends on the end user's question. We get stuff just about every day that comes in uh, of areas people are are looking into. Um, so if if there's questions on data and you're not quite sure what to make of it, which is totally fair. There's a lot of information here. Um, mm. We're always happy to kind of give some insight and steering advice on, um, you know, kind of what what to make out of it. But it, it really just depends on what your use case is and, and what your question is that you're looking to answer. So so follow up to that. It sounds like, because I heard that there's this keynote that I went to and the, the speaker said, you're copying out if you just show the data and you don't provide insight. And I was like, I'm copying out, what do you say? And I just thought it was really interesting point of like, as data specialists, we're in this data all the time. We're really good with data. We're actually some of the best people to come up with the takeaways about data. And so for some people, like you said, it's very complicated for like an average lay person. Um, so it sounds like you take questions and you'll help people explore them. So if somebody were to say, hey, during COVID, I heard there were less drivers and that could increase speeds on highways. And I heard if you go faster, you have higher fatality rate. Is that true? And uh, <laughs> so I was just curious, like, is that how you guys operate? People will come to you with a question, then you'll explore it? Is yeah, it so it, it, it totally depends, right? I am, I'm one person within a center and this is part of the, the function that I help to kind of deliver um, as the end product. But we have a lot of different people in our center um, that do different research projects on specific areas. So it really just depends on the question they're looking for. Um, I, I know specifically with these dashboards, like these show trends in specific emphasis areas, right? So if you're looking at non-motorists, you can see over this span of time, which we almost have 10 years of data in here now, um, you can kind of see some of the differentiations between uh, over years or patterns of things that happen over time. Um, and that's part of what we're looking to build out by having the person and vehicle level information as well of being able to see different trends um, within the data. That being said, you know, the, the repository, if you're pulling data out of there, it's kind of just giving you the, the output, right? And then you're looking at whatever you're interested in your area. So whether it's all the data in your region, it's all the crashes on a certain route, whatever it might be, um, these are kind of gearing users towards, 
hey, these are some of the most frequently asked questions we get, and these are some of the trends that we see in the data and the way we have them displayed here. That being said, the range of questions we receive is really wide of what mm. people are looking at or what they're trying to answer or what they need for a grant for, you know, to show is happening in their community. So uh, this is trying to make the data more accessible to, to everyone to be able to kind of go off and explore. And if you had specific questions, we're of course always happy to, to help, especially if um, it's not easily available or easy, easily queried in these specific tools. Uh, as an example, something we had recently was uh, someone wanted to look at crashes with school vans, which um, we have school buses here as, as, as an emphasis area, but school vans is a little bit different and it's classified differently um, when you look at the back end of the data. So it's not quite as easy and straightforward to pull. Uh, so with that type of information, we were able to kind of pull it from the back end of the data and uh, kind of help guide them on what, what they were seeing with it. They wanted to look at specifically the uh, behavior of drivers and if there were uh, more crashes specifically um, more crashes and more, I think, violations or something, um, which which wasn't a trend we necessarily saw in the data, but that was something they were curious about. So we were able to kind of help them with that. Very good. Thanks, Jen. No problem. And so should be good to go. All right. Um, so thank you all. Um, we're going to be talking about the uh, parcel data set. Um, basically a little bit of background on how um, how and why we collected it and, and kind of the process that we went through to actually take all of those uh, various different data sets and kind of smash them into one big, huge data set. So um, Leah, if you could go to the next slide, please. All right, so uh, Leah Hodges and I who, um, are going to be talking about this. So Leah is the GIS analyst that kind of did most of this work and kind of suffered through the six months of uh, kind of proverbially smashing the atom here. Um, uh, next slide. So um, real quick, uh, just as a recap for, you know, not everyone kind of under knows uh, kind of what we're, why we're doing this. So there is a you know state legislation that says that um, all the towns have to submit their parcel data um, and CAMA data to the COGS and then uh, the COGS reported back to us. Um, that was instituted back in 2018, 2019. So the data has been collected since 2019, but it hasn't been until the last you know three or four years that the the, the quality on the CAMA data has really really significantly improved. Um, that is in no small part due to the efforts of um, the members of the CAMA working group, which was uh, recently kind of brought under the auspices of the GIS Advisory Council. Um, they've done a tremendous amount of work in the past, making sure that the CAMA standard, uh, uh, the, the, not the CAMA standard, yeah, the CAMA standard uh, in the schema uh, uh, were kind of adhered to and people actually followed. Um, and submitted data using that. Um, there's about 136 fields in, or so in it. Um, uh, next slide, please, Leah. Um, so uh, typically the way this goes is, you know, sometime around now we start doing the, uh, we, we're gonna, we start doing the outreach. Um, we are a little bit late, but we're also down a person, which is why we're a little bit late in doing the outreach, um, but we do intend to kind of catch up quickly. Um, so that being said, so typically by May 1st, all of the towns submit the data to the COGS. Um, and then sometime shortly after that, usually about a month or so, the COGS get it to us, uh, uh, you know, picking up any stragglers along the way. And then we kind of work with them to kind of figure out, okay, who's still missing? What, are there any errors? And it's a lot of back and forth. Um, generally, um, in the last two years since the GIS office has been involved in this process. Um, we have been very successful in getting a, basically almost everybody um, from in terms of uh, parcel and camera data. I think in the last collection, we we're only still missing just one town. Um, we'll see if we can get it, um, get that one for the next uh, go around, but you know, those things happen. Um, so, 
part of the context here is so like we've been collecting this data so like 2020 it was okay 2021 data was actually pretty good uh the 2022 data was even better um but you know no one had gone through the the, the frankly monumental effort of kind of combining it all into a single data set with all of the information kind of like usable in a gis format which is really what's going to um, light up and enable a lot of the work that people want to do with this data set. Um, so that when, you know, when we got this year's collection and we were kind of more fully staffed, um, our goal was like to aspire to do more with the data set and actually creating the single um, feature class data set uh, as we as we have. So this is going to be that this the description of that process so we basically started out and collected all of the data in 2023 um received it and then started doing our usual analytics and then from there i will pass it off to leah to talk about how the process went okay uh can you hear me everyone can hear me yep okay yep. um so as this is the this slide is just a brief overview of what happened. We assessed um, the data, we merged and consolidated the camera data, and then we merged and consolidated the parcel data, and then we created the whole state layer by joining them. So as stated previously, municipalities were notified that submissions for this year was were due on May first, twenty twenty three, and this year's collection, um, one hundred sixty five towns submitted camera data, and one hundred forty seven towns submitted parcel data. Um, for this data set, if no entry was submitted, a uh, historical 2022 data was used. Uh, for the In the case of the CAMA data, only three towns needed historical data, with one town having no historical data to use. So they are, they will be grayed out in this data set for extra information besides parcel geometry. And um, 22 towns use historical data for their parcels this year. Like stated before, um, we are also responsible for collecting digital parcel data, but unlike the camera data, the parcel data has no schema to adhere to, making their naming conventions vary significantly. Um, for example, you could have muni, municipality, and town name, and those are all the same fields in um, different towns. Uh, also, the amount of data within each parcel for parcel data for towns varies some have more um, cam information and some just have the basic uh, parcel geometry information that you could need. Um, as mentioned before, the camera does have a schema which was implemented prior to the 2022 collection. Um, when the camera was collected and submitted previously, that was by IGG, IGPP and it wasn't consolidated into one big uh, camera table and it, was, it wasn't posted for the public. Um, this schema was created and designed by the camera creation working group, like stated before. They worked on this for years and it included um, collaborations with both camera vendors and assessors. The chart below shows the improvement to the compliance of the schema with um, 125 towns complying in 2022 and 138 towns complying in this year's collection. Um, it is of note that if a town submitted the acts were 136 fields, but then had a few extra fields. They were marked as non-compliant for this year's collection. Um, as you can see in the uh, cutout of headers, the naming conventions for headers in each town can vary greatly. You can have um, spaces in between words. You can have no spaces in between words, or you have a completely different way of naming headers for the town. Um, all together, there are about 1,200 unique fields used in submission this year. Um, and for this data set, we wanted to condense the 136 to the minimum information we thought was most prevalent, and we wanted to put that in the forefront. Um, this chart shows the uh, fields we did take and then put into this data set. So it's mostly um, property values, assessed values, appraisal values, uh, ownership, and where the owners are located. Um, oh, no, that's this, sorry. Okay. 
um, since most of the camera entries did adhere to the um, standard, most of um, consolidation was done programmatically. Um, earlier in the year, the Cogs or Towns were asked to fill out a spreadsheet that stated which linking column was for both the parcel and the camera data. Um, once we got those names, we did check the match rate from both camera to parcel and parcel to camera. Once those match rates were concluded, if a town did not or a town or cog did not provide an answer, a match rate was run on um, any possible fields that could be a match rate and the greatest match rate was chosen. Um, in this collection, the lowest match rate used was about 60% and that guaranteed that at least more than half of the town's uh, parcels got linked back to a camera entry. Um, but there are also some cases where the linking field provided was more than one column. So we had to concatenate that column and put any uh, in between symbol, like a dash or a slash in between that would create the link back to the parcel data. Uh, after the linking field was identified, anything that was not in our minimum plus the linking field was deleted from that camera set, not the raw data, but the modified data that we have. Uh, once that was done, every town had a unique identifier code or town census code added to the front of their linking code to make the linking field a truly unique identifier. Uh, altogether, excluding the one town that we have no historical data for, there was about 1.3 million entries. Uh, below on the slide, you can see some of the code I used to combine all of the camera together and to delete the non-minimum fields from the data. The next process was to standardize the parcel data we did receive. Since, like I said, the parcel data as of right now has no standardized schema and they had a lot of variation, we opted to field map these um, fields into a schema, which ended up being, I think we, we took we took location, edit date, editor, <clears throat> link field, shape length and shape area. Those are our six fields that we wanted. Uh, we opted for field mapping instead of writing a big code because that could become messy and it was more, uh, it wasn't e efficient if we weren't going to be using it again. There were intentionally no changes made to the parcel geometry. So whatever the town gave us is what we uh, uploaded. So that means there are there will be some overlapping of parcels on um, town borders. And altogether, it was about 1.2 million parcels. Uh, one of the problems that arose when creating this data set was duplications. So there were quite a few parcels that had the same geometry layered on top of each other, but mostly mostly the issue came from roadways and water bodies. Those sometimes can be left null or empty, and this resulted in extra attributes being added to the final table when attempting to join the camera data set to the parcel data set. Uh, it was around about 100,000 entries extra. Uh, and as you can see from the image, I after I used the find I identical tool in ArcPro, uh, it's mostly road networks that were the issue. So we took out everything but one of the identified um, identical and then joined the camera to the parcel data without any uh, any more issues. Uh, altogether, 1.1 million, about 1.1 million parcels were able to link back to the camera data. Um, on our geo data portal, we have a parcel landing page with information regarding the creation of the data set, like additional information. Uh, there's links to download data by individual COG, and there's also a preview of the data set to interact with on the page, um, and also uh, links to additional information about um, the statutes that give us the ability to make this happen. Um, at the moment, the data set is available to download, but it is 4.5 gigabytes and it will take some time to download as a file due to database. Uh, 
also on our um parcel landing page we have the first iteration of our um parcel viewer um and once experience builder evolves or so our parcel viewer but as of right now uh we have um the standard functionality such as um searching for addresses zooming into cogs or towns zooming in and out of the map at your choice of ba base map to view um, once you click on a parcel, all in, all the minimum camera information I talked about before would be there, and um, there are additional links to download the parcels on that page. And if you do interact with the page, please leave feedback for us to, to tell us how we could improve and make it better. On the G Open Connecticut Open Data Portal, you can find all of the raw camera data and parcel data by cog all you have to do is go to the website type in connecticut state parcel layer click into it um then do what you would come to the second picture i have which is the data set itself and just scroll down and there should be a show more button you click that and then there should be zip files for you to um download you could also take a use the qr code and it will take you directly to the second page without having to um type anything in. Hey, Leah, if I may interject, can you back up a couple of slides? I want to make a comment about some things that have changed on the uh, on the landing page and the, with the data mm -hmm. recently. So um, <clears throat> one of the issues that we've been having um, with the data um, was you weren't able to download the entire thing. Um, previously, it just it was a technical glitch that um, prevented us from downloading the entire uh, state. Um, it was actually a single water body parcel somewhere in the Northwest Hills that just had an error in it, and it prevented the entire state from being able to be downloaded. Uh, we So we tried a bunch of things. Basically, in the last couple of months, we've been trying to resolve this issue because we haven't been able to download the data set. We've come up with kind of interim parallel solutions and things like that. Um, ultimately, we ended up having to delete the original service and republish a new one. Um, so I will say that if you have already accessed this data set and are using it through like a REST endpoint in an application, you will need to pull that um, uh, service in again. We apologize for that. But I think the net benefit is that uh, we've improved the data set. So, you know, obviously we fixed the downloading issue. So now you can download the uh, the entire um, 1.247 some odd million parcels um, in its entirety. Be warned, it does take about 20 minutes because it is about five gigabytes worth of data. Um, but um, in addition to that, we made some kind of uh, minor fundamental changes while we were at it. Um, primarily, we made the uh, uh, default uh, visualization hollow so that when you pull it in by default, you don't have to automatically um, make it hollow so that you can see through them. Um, we also added uh, a, a couple of fields that we missed the first go around, um, mainly just like state ma uh, the mailing address state um, and then the, the um, state uh, land use codes and descriptions. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, it, it, it was just kind of one of those things that we tried to make it so that it was as seamless as possible and retain the original URL, but it in the end, it ended up not being possible. And I just wanted to call that out in case anybody had been using the uh, the service as a, uh, as a REST endpoint. You will unfortunately have to basically update your applications to use the new service. Um, but on the upside, better data, more data, and the whole thing works as a download now. Sorry, um, that's it. Uh, we can... I'm actually going to pass this back off to you. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. All right. So um, what's coming for the 2024 collection? Um, so we are in the process of kind of figuring out what it is that um, we're going to be doing. We will likely convene the CAMA working group. Um, uh, one's just to talk about some potential minor changes um, and then uh, to the camera schema. I'm very hesitant to add anything to that schema because it's already huge at about 136 fields. But I think, you know, some of the uh, the the slight change that we're discussing, I think, might be worth the effort. Um, uh, in addition to that, we are going to, for the first time, ask for a required schema for the parcels. 
it's not going to be anything crazy. It's basically going to be about six fields that we realistically we're interested in. It's basically just like the uh, the link field, the address field for verification, and any of the editor uh, tracking fields that are inherent to the parcels, as well um, as uh, you know maybe some additional information that is uh, native to the parcel, uh, the GIS parcel data, as opposed to coming from the camera. Um, the particular focus that we're going to have on this year's collection is making sure uh, that the link field between the camera and the parcels are viable. Um, as you may or may not have heard me talk about in other contexts before, we are planning to uh, provide some assistance uh, through the COGS to those municipalities that do need that additional help and making sure that the, um, uh, the, the CAMA and the parcel link field is valid. Um, we are still coming up with the requirements of that um, due to a, um, a personnel shift. We are a little bit behind on that process, but we are still on track to complete that this year, mainly because we have to. Um, and, uh, and in addition to that, uh, we are working on the final revisions to the parcel drafting guidelines that was uh, um, drafted up by uh, the, uh, that particular group headed up by Thad Demkowski uh, uh, in the advisory council. Um, there's a lot of really good content in there. I just want, uh, we are just in the final stages of, um, of uh, basically review and restructuring of that document so that it reads the, the way we want it to basically. Um, and those, while we are not going to hold anybody's feet to the fire on this collection, we do want to release that document with the request. Um, so that people can kind of at least have an idea of what's coming and how um, and how the 25 submission is going to go and what changes in, in progress we are, for lack of a better word, we're kind of expecting for the, the subsequent collections. I mean, my hope is that as people kind of adhere to the parcel drafting guidelines, um, uh, we uh, organically improve the parcel data set in such a way that all of those geometry issues that we currently see in the data set kind of go away on their own, um, especially between the towns, because if we follow the, uh, the, the, the recommendations in that document, it, things will get better on their own. Um, so back to the this year's collection. So we are working on finalizing some of the minor changes for the parcel stuff. We will be reaching out to um, the um, uh, the the CAMA working group, and then start re outreach with the COGS, um, the CAMA and GIS vendors, as well as the municipalities on on what those changes are and and how we're going to be collecting the data this year. Um, and one other little bit of forward looking uh, information is that we are trying to work on a platform to make the submissions easier and more automated with built in validation. Um, but as you can imagine, that is not an easy task and that will take some time to complete. So that is um, still a little bit out in the future. Um, and with that, we are open to questions about anything and everything. Thank you, Alfredo. Thank you, Leah. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand or drop them in the chat. I can read them out. Um, I did have a, a quick question question off the bat. I saw that the data was available both in the geodata portal um, as usual and then also at CT data. Yes. So is that going to be kind of like a standard going forward or is it already yeah. a standard, I guess I should ask? Yeah. So the data was previous. So the, the unconso uh, unconsolidated data was previously um, uh, um, posted on the open data portal. Um, and uh, so that's where all the rate raw data is. So like basically the raw submissions that we get from the towns are basically we just dump them into like uh, file geo databases for the parcel side and then a big zip folder with cam uh, with CSVs on the camera side. Um, but they, those are as we receive them and we always wanna make sure that there's a copy like that on the open data portal. Um, but as far as the consolidated data set and some of those other derivatives, um, we have a federation built in place between the two. It's unfortunately still a one way from the geo data to the open data. So basically any and every service that is on the, on the geo data portal will automatically be synchronized to the open data portal. 
Um, so you will see it in both places, but when you see it on the open data portal, it will just redirect you back to the geodata portal where the where the data lives. Um, so um, that's kind of how that is meant to work. Um, but we will always kind of like um, for every main submission, we will uh, basically append and attach as a as an extra the raw data and then a consolidated version of the camera on the open data portal because it's non tabular it's tabular non spatial data. So we were just going to push all of that over there. <laughs> um, I see, uh, Nick, um, the, to answer your question about the URL uh, for the parcel service, it is on the geodata portal. If you go to the um, if you go to the item page for the parcel data set, um, uh, I believe it's one of the options when you view full data is to uh, pull the REST endpoint API um, URL. So. Um, if you have any questions or have any trouble, just reach out. Oh, and quick plug um, about that. Um, on So uh, uh, this is specifically for state agency folks. Uh, we are having a webinar for state agency folks next week on the use of the geodata portal. We are going to be recording it and posting it on the geodata portal. And then we are also planning to have a wider um, uh, uh, basically repeat that webinar again for a, for this audience and uh, plus more, whoever, um, at a future date. But we wanted to kind of use the state agency folks and, and use that um, as our kind of pilot and um, kind of, uh, you know, guinea pig, so to speak, to make sure that we kind of explain what we need to explain. Um, but like I said, in either case, we will be recording it and posting it up so this group can see that um, presentation as well after the fact. Any other questions? Um, we did have a couple more minutes here. I had another additional question if no one else had one, which I'm not seeing. But essentially, it's kind of just a clarification question um, about the uh, requirements for submitting the data. Yep. Um, so municipalities submitting their, their parcel data to the COGS, I believe May 1st, it was stated. Yep. Um, if that data comes in without the CAMA standard, they're considered not compliant or Correct. does that fall we, We'll still take the data, yeah. but we, you know, it, it just means more work for us and it means that the consolidated data set takes longer to produce. So it's basically, if you find value in this product, please adhere to the standard and it will expedite our processing of it so that we can get this back to you guys sooner. Part, you know, this is, that is essentially the reason that this took six months um, to produce in the first place is because there was, especially on the parcel side and with the, in the, in with the, the kind of the linking field uh, stuff, it was a little bit of the wild west and it was just so all over the place that there was no automation possible. Um, it was very much a manual process across the board. So the more that we can either work with the camera vendors and all of the and the GIS vendors and or staff that do this work and make sure that these these two data sets link inherently within each town, um, the the better it will be and the faster we can produce this data set for you going forward. And with higher quality, <laughs> importantly. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Eric. Yeah, hi guys. Um, I'm just, I might have missed it, so I apologize if I did. Um, are there any major tweaks or or any to the to the uh, standard uh, camera exports for the major vendors, or are they the same as last year? I know there was It'll, talk about reducing the fields. Yeah, well, so I don't think we're going to necessarily reduce the field. Um, I don't think um, that's necessary yet. I mean, it is a lot, but I mean, if someone just doesn't have carry that information, it don't carry that information. Um, we were looking to, uh, 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 unfortunately, add an additional field, but uh, we can talk about that when we kind of do our outreach. Um, I think the field that we're looking to add makes sense to add just to, um, it's like a very functional kind of thing. I don't really want to get into here, but um, if we can definitely talk about it and I don't think it'll be a huge lift to uh, ask for this additional field. But primarily the focus of our efforts for this year 
is making sure that the link field is as clearly identified and as uh, valid as possible. And at this point, all the major camera vendors have participated and so be okay. Yeah. I know there's a couple where there's like one town that uses something. I mean, I clearly, yeah. Not, yeah. Yeah. So. so we have to do the outreach um, on uh, for this potential change. I don't think this is really going to be a change that anybody balks at. Um, so, um, you know, it should be fairly stable and they kind of want to leave it stable for the time being, just because we want to uh, focus our efforts on the viability of the link between the parcels and the camera. Thanks. All right. So I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, all right. I appreciate the time, Alfredo and Leah. Mm -hmm. Definitely um, good information coming out of your office. Um, so with that, I think we're going to move on to uh, our next agenda item, which are the elections. Um, so as I mentioned earlier in the beginning of the webinar, um, each year, you know, during the winter webinar, we have these elections for our steering committee. Um, there's approximately six positions every year that come up for election because the term for each uh, steering committee member is three years. Um, what steering committee members do is they essentially just guide the types of services that the network provides. Um, it's usually in the form of uh, putting together these webinars. Like I said, we do them quarterly. And then um, every fall, we put together a, a conference, a one-day conference uh, during GIS day. Um, it's usually uh, at a university somewhere around the state. Um, and it's just a really great networking opportunity and um, a, a good uh, committee to be involved with. Um, you also represent the interests of all the GIS users in the state of Connecticut. Um, and uh, we meet monthly in their, uh, our meetings, you know, are, are informal. They're about 30 minutes long. Um, and we just plan upcoming events uh, throughout the year. So uh, this, uh, during this election period, we have um, a number of uh, sector representatives uh, positions available. We have the education representative as well as the state representative. And uh, we currently are missing a utility and nonprofit profit representative as well. So if anybody uh, knows of anyone or anybody on the call today is interested in the utility or the nonprofit uh, representative seat, um, we're still looking for nominations for those two. Um, but we do have uh, nominations for the education representative as well as the state representative um, and then we also have two member at large seats available as well. So the way this is going to work, it's going to be live. Um, I'm going to send out a Google Forms link in the chat. Um, we're going to start with the sector representatives. Um, we do that because if, uh, you know, a sector representative um, faces competition here, which we do have for the educational rep, um, whoever doesn't win that seat will be automatically put into the member at large candidate pool. So we're sending out that link in the chat now. And you all should be able to go ahead and um, cast your votes for the sector representative. While I do that, I'm gonna pull up a bit of the bios of the candidates. All right. So for the sector representative positions for under education, we have Nadia Ahmed from Yale University. Nadia is a PhD student at the Yale School of Environment and an associate professor of law at Barry University. 
She is the co-chair of the American Bar Association's Environmental Justice Task Force and an ABA observer to COP28. And then we also have Kurt Schlittling uh, out of Fairfield University. Kurt currently serves as the education rep for the Connecticut GIS Network and is working on an inventory of GIS programs offered in the state. Um, once it's completed, it would be a resource for those seeking continued education in GIS, as well as an impressive network of contacts among universities for the network to tap into. He hopes to continue serving in this role. And then for the state representative, we have Kayvon Harris. Kayvon works for Connecticut DOT. He's an enthusiastic professional with a robust knowledge of GIS and geospatial concepts. Um, and he would be honored to be considered for the position. So I'm going to leave my screen up there. Also, during the voting, you can read those bios right on the answers. And I'll be leaving this open for another uh, couple minutes here. We have about 20 responses. Um, let's check on the participation. It's a pretty tight race right now. So I'm going to leave it open for another couple minutes. Make sure you guys get those votes in. I'll stop sharing my screen for a minute so I can check on. All right, we have about 65 people in the meeting with about 25 responses. So I'm going to leave it open for just another couple minutes here. The education rep is going back and forth right now. Um, state rep, Kayvon, man, you're, you're taking it away. You got about 100%. It's unheard of. All right, let's cast those votes. I will I will give it one more minute before we announce the winner here. I love the beginning question here. Are you ready to do some voting? Everyone's so excited. Uh, and we have a few people who just realize they don't have a choice. Okay, it looks like we're kind of plateauing in the number of responses. So I am going to stop accepting responses now and I will share my screen to show the results. All right, so as I was saying, we have 31 responses. 93.5% of you were excited. Um, and then for the tight race here for education rep, we have Kurt coming away with it with 58%. So congratulations, Kurt. You're gonna be serving as our education rep for another two years, I believe that is for. Um, Nadia, we're gonna throw your name into the bucket for members at large. And like I said, Kayvon, took it away, man. Um, congratulations on becoming the state rep. All right. All right, so I'm just gonna, 
grab the link for the next Google Sheet. Okay, I'm going to drop it in the chat. All right, everyone, so I just sent the link in the chat to the member at large voting sheet. Um, you can go ahead and submit responses for that. And I will pull up the candidate sheet to share with all of you. All right, so for members at large, uh, again, oh, I'm not sharing my screen. There we go. Members at large, again, we have Nadia, Yale University, um, put into the member at large group here. Um, we have Tracy de Grazia from uh, a municipality, I believe it's East Hartford. Um, Tracy has been a GIS professional for over 10 years and has held positions in various industries, including government, utilities, and education. Uh, Tracy currently works as the GIS analyst for the town of East Hartford. That's correct. All right, so we also have Richard Kraut there uh, from NVCOG. He is running for his, his second term after completing two successful years as secretary for the network. He would be honored to continue serving uh, the Connecticut GIS community. And then we also have Timothy Wenborn from New England Geosystems. This would be Timothy's second term. He has been heavily involved in the user network so far. He was lead at GIS Day 2021 at UConn and would love to serve a second term. Um, then we also have Thad Dimkowski, uh, CCSU in town of South Windsor. He's been involved in the network for 20 plus years and has been involved with CCSU for 12 plus years. He wants back in. And then we have Mark Kasinkas from Burns and McDonald and Cheshire Fire Department. Mark is a senior environmental scientist with Burns and McDonald, where he provides geospatial and land use planning support for energy infrastructure planning, permitting and maintenance. He also provides GIS analytical support to the Cheshire Fire Department, where he is a 30 plus year life member. Past GIS work in Connecticut has included mapping to support open space acquisition and management uh, projects for several water companies and municipalities. Mark holds a bachelor's in geography from CCSU and a master's in forestry from Yale. So those are our member at large candidates. Make sure you cast your votes. I'm going to stop sharing now. Take a look at the responses. All right, we have 28 responses. Uh, we hovered, I think we ended around 31 from the previous. So just give it another minute or so. We're taking a look at the results. Oh, we shot up to 30. So make sure you get those in we're at 31 we have another couple minutes here until we move on to our next presentation at 10 45. Okay, we have 37 responses, more so 
for the member at large this time than we did for the sector seats. Again, if you know a utility rep or a nonprofit rep, let us know. Those seats are still available. Okay. We are plateauing here at 37 responses. And I am going to halt responses here. It seems like we're plateauing at 37. So I'm going to stop accepting responses for this and the way this one worked out, I'm gonna to have to kind of do some breakdown. So um, with that, I'm gonna leave you guys on a cliffhanger here. Um, we're gonna to go to our next presentation and then I will come back with the results of the member at large, the two member at large positions. Um, and so after this next presentation, I'll reveal the results of the member at large voting, and then we'll go right into our first steering meeting. So um, those that are elected on and those that are on the call right now as part of the steering committee, um, after the next presentation, please hang out, please stay on. We're gonna go right into our first uh, steering committee meeting um as our new members where we're going to be electing officer positions that's the you know secretary vice president president positions of the steering committee so uh with that i'm gonna hand it over to sarah hurley from opm um, who will be introducing the connecticut housing dashboard so sarah if you're on awesome hi, hi. Um, share my screen the right one. Okay. Can can you hear this? Okay. Yep, I can see it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. Um. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Hurley. Um, I'm a GIS analyst at the GIS office. Um, I'm going to be talking through the development of the Connecticut Housing Data Hub dashboard that we were able to release publicly a few weeks ago. Um, so we're going to go quickly through the, an overview of the dashboard, um, talk about how it was developed and what we hope to have in future versions of it. Um, so due to increasing investments by the state in affordable housing, the governor's office wanted a way to share available housing data um, and help keep track of housing growth. Um, after seeing a simple housing dashboard that New York State published, um, they decided that they wanted a Connecticut housing dashboard um, and that would be a helpful tool to be able to use. Um, once that was decided, there were um, several interagency discussions to decide what information should be shown on the dashboard. And then from that, we were able to develop and publish the Connecticut Housing Data Hub. Um, this was developed by OPM, DOH, and DECD. Um, the dashboard gives users the ability to visually explore Connecticut um, housing data from uh, a few state and federal sources. Uh, the data is split up into five separate categories on the dashboard um, that I'm gonna do a quick overview on. Um, so a little later in the presentation, I'll go through the layout of the actual pages. Um, but this is just a quick overview of each of the pages. Um, the first is the home page, which focuses on displaying the overall change in housing units over a 10 year span. And then also in the bottom right corner, we have the Redfin housing market indicator data. Um, for the most recent month that that data was published. And then the next page is the uh, permitting and demolition data. This covers um, the net change in housing count based on permits. 
um, and demolition across the state. And then you can also view the total permitted units, the total demoed units, um, and percentages of change in permits over time. And then the next page is the housing stock um, page. And this shows the total number of housing units per town based on occupancy type. Um, and then the other two tabs have the housing count ratio based on tenure status and um, unit structure type. And then our fourth page is um, rent burden. Um, so we have the median income for each town, the median gross rent for each town, and then um, rent burden, which is a relationship between the median income and the median gross rent um, to get a better understanding of where housing is unaffordable in the state. And then our last tab is um, housing programs in Connecticut. Um, the first section is an overview of all of the uh, units that are assisted in the housing programs. And then each tab after that is an overview of each individual um, program specifically. So all of the data that is mapped in the dashboard comes from three main data sources, um, plus the Redfin data that was on the homepage. Um, the main sources are Department of Housing um, for the housing programs data, um, the Department of Economic and Community Development for the permitting and demolition data, and then the US Census, um, the American Community Survey was the um, housing stock and count data. So the Department of Housing um, maintains a yearly data set for affordable housing programs in Connecticut. Um, this includes government assisted programs, um, tenant rental assistance programs, um, CHFA and USDA mortgages, um, and deed restricted units. Um, and then this data is available on the Connecticut Open Data Portal um, publicly, and it is updated on a yearly basis. Um, the data from the Department of Economic and Community Development. Um, the DCD maintains several um, annual permitting and demolition data sets for each town. Um, and those are stored in a series of Excel spreadsheets um, on their website. So we were able to pull that data and combine it into a single table to use for the dashboard. And then for housing counts, we got that data from the US Census American Community Survey. Um, to pull that data, we used the Tidy Census R package. Um, and then we were able to pull um, a variety of the five year housing data categories for each town in Connecticut um, and then aggregate them into a single data set and per perform any necessary calculations on the data. Um, such as the, the rent burden calculation and a few others. And then lastly, the Redfin um, data is published on a monthly basis. Redfin updates the Connecticut housing market overview page with the most recent data available. Um, so we are able to pull the data right off that website and include it on the homepage to have an up-to-date view on um, how's it market indicators? So once we have all of our data sets um, in hand and organized, we are able to spatialize the data sets by town using the Connecticut municipalities layer. Um, and then on ArcGIS Online, we created a series of web maps. Um, for all the parameters that were decided that we wanted to include on the dashboard. Um, for most of the maps, the field being displayed was ready to use as a column in the data set. Um, but for some of the maps, we needed to calculate across a few columns. So we were able to use Arcade in um, ArcGIS Online um, to do the calculations and configure the symbology for the maps. 
Um, and also a lot of the pages have a details pop up when you click on a town and we were able to configure that using Arcade as well. So this is just a quick example from um, the housing stock page, I believe. Um, so when you click on a town, there is um, an area that shows the pop-up, which shows a table and a pie chart of the data. Um, and we made the table with an arcade script and then the pie chart was made with second arcade script. Um, so it uh, grabs the attributes that we're interested in from the data and adjusts the values based on the year and the town selected um, on the page. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty cool way to be able to customize the pop-ups and um, see the changes based on user selections. So once we have all of the maps created in AGOL, we were able to develop the dashboard. Um, the main goal is to create an application that allows the users to easily see all of the different data types um, of, of the housing data um, in maps and charts over the time range that we have the data available for. And to do that, we use Experience Builder to create a multi-page application. Um, so originally the design started as a simple like one page um, Connecticut housing at a glance overview. Um, but once that was built, it was decided that we wanted to expand the dashboard into um, a larger application that included um, data from several other sources. So um, from there, we expanded the application to have uh, the multiple tabs and all the sub tabs. Um, so this was one of the earlier iterations of that design. Um, the, the dashboard went through a few iterations since then, um, but ultimately we decided on something that was um, a little bit cleaned up and easy to, to understand and navigate. So this is the basic organization of the, um, of the dashboard. Um, it focuses on nested categories to be able to look at um, the, the large amount of diverse data in the application. Um, so this is an example of the hierarchy. Um, so the permitting data is broken up into five separate sections. The housing stock data is broken up into three sections. Um, and then we have those other tabs that are also broken up into other subcategories. And let's see, so this is um, a sample page of one of our um, tabs um, for each page. This is the general layout of all the elements that you see. Um, some pages don't include all of these elements, like some don't have a chart or they don't have the pop-up feature. Um, but in general, this is, this is um, our layout that we were building off of. Um, so for, for each page, there is a legend and a map, of course. Um, in the web map, you're able to zoom in and out. Um, and when you zoom in, you can see um, the town labels. And then over on the left side, there is a drop down where you can select either the year or for the um, five year American Community Survey data, it's um, a five year range. So when you select the different years, it adjusts what the map looks like. Um, and then if you, when you click on a town, the chart in the bottom right corner will adjust for the data just for that town. And then this box will show the pop-up information, um, which is usually a table um, just with the, the data laid out so that you can, you can better understand what exactly is in the data sets. 
So once we had the um, dashboard built and all the data all set, we had our colleagues help do some user testing um, and give us feedback on the dashboard. Um, so this ended up being a pretty long process um, that, that involved a lot of back and forth, um, a lot of text editing, um, rebuilding pages and updating data sets or replacing data sets um, and troubleshooting a lot of errors. Um, so on this slide, these are some of the screenshots that we got from our colleagues that were user testing where data was inaccessible or there were errors to read the data. Um, a lot of times the widgets and experience builder like to resize themselves um, in a weird way based on your screen size. Um, the um, loading of the data um, was a little bit of a challenge before we optimized the data sets. Um, so yeah, so this, this took a little bit of back and forth to figure out all the, the quirks, um, but I think we ironed most of them out at this point. Um, so one of the big errors that we had was that I'm going to try to explain this and hopefully it makes sense. It's a little hard to explain um, without the, the dashboard in front of me. Um, but when you selected a town in one tab and then the user switched to another tab and selected another town, um, the chart on the second tab would say something about invalid data. Um, so this took me a while to figure out. Um, but eventually I was able to figure out that um, the data was not reset, the, the filters were not resetting themselves as you switch between tabs. Um, so originally um, this was our setup for the um, uh, like one, one of the main tabs, we would have a map has one copy of the data set. So each of the maps had a copy of the data set. The maps were linked to the charts so that when you clicked on the towns, the charts would um, switch to that town. But all of the charts were built off of the original copy of the data set. So when you were switching between tabs, um, it just didn't want to reset the filtering. So it was just throwing us a bunch of errors. Um, so I was able to figure it out by building the charts off of, um, I added a second copy of the same data set to the map and set it on um, like invisible so you couldn't see it. Um, and then we built the chart off of that data set. And that seems to have worked. It seems to have solved our problems. I haven't heard of any other errors in that way in a while. So. Um, so that was just an interesting problem that we had um, that we were able to, to solve. And then going forward, um, we would like to create a more automated version of the um, dashboard. So we wanna set up um, the data so that it's it can automatically update the dashboard periodically when the new data is added or published over time. Um, so this will help keep the dashboard up to date with the current data and you can better see the changes in housing as time goes on. Um, and in addition, we're hoping to publish documentation about the whole development of the dashboard and the use of all the data sets um, in the soon to near future. Um, and that's about it. So thank you for your attention. I'm leaving the link to our landing page here. I'll pop it in the chat afterwards. Um, but you can go check out the housing dashboard, um, uh, see if anything uh, breaks, please let me know. Um, but I can take any, any questions now. Um, Thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, so if there are any questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand again or just 
drop them in the chat. Um, see a couple have already been answered in here. Uh, we did have a question from Garrett. Sorry if you missed it. Is there a link to where the mapping is posted? I think you got that right up there on the screen, right, Sarah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you okay. should be able to go there and, and see everything from there. Awesome. And I'm looking at the uh, geodata portal landing page right now. It's nice. You know, you've got the housing tab right up top. Um, another thing I did want to mention, since this was such a heavy, uh, you know, OPM GIS office uh, agenda today, they do have a newsletter that goes out. I believe that's every month. That that's posted it's uh after every advisory council meeting the next one is going out later today awesome well, there we go good little plug yep. <laughs> okay i'm not seeing any other questions right now so um again thank you sarah for the presentation a lot of great work put into that Thank you. All right. All right. And so with that, I guess I can reveal the results of the member at large voting. So we had two positions available. Uh, it was a tight race here at the end. Um, the way it was set up, I had to, you know, calculate how many were uh, voted on for the first member position, then also for the second, make sure that, you know, I wasn't um, miscounting there. So apologize for leaving you all on a bit of a cliffhanger, but Nadia Ahmed, uh, congratulations. Um, you are on the steering committee as a member at large, as well as uh, Thad. Welcome back, Thad. Um, you are now back on the steering committee member. And thank you to everyone, all the nominees, uh, everyone you know that participated both today and for the election. So uh, I greatly appreciate it. And um, again, for those that are sticking around, let me make sure I'm not missing anything here on our agenda. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, that's it for today's uh, webinar. Uh, again, thank you all for joining. Um, those that are on the steering committee, please uh, stay on the call. We're going to go right into our um, steering committee meeting um, and we're going to have some officer elections during that meeting. So uh, thank you all for joining today and I hope you have a great Friday. And if you're off Monday, enjoy the long weekend. And Mike, you're back. Did I miss something? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Sounds like the meeting went well. <laughs>